Take, for example, Martin Keller, former chair of the psychiatry department at Brown University, lead author of the so-called Paxil 329 study. This clinical trial, which tested hundreds of children on the antidepressant Paxil, and hundreds of children, and hundreds, hundreds of, of children, children, found that the drug was generally well-tolerated and effective, which in scientific terms is glowing praise. And the study's list of co-authors, 22 of the most prominent key opinion leaders in psychiatry. I mean, that was a lot of people, but they were the who's who of psychiatry. And this was going to be a publication that I think, you know, took them, you know, the, into the end zone on getting their approval for kids. With the FDA's blessing, Paxil became a blockbuster in the child and adolescent market, with sales of $55 million in 2002. It wasn't until the New York State Attorney General's office sued in 2004 that the truth finally came out. The raw data showed that not only was Paxil no more effective than placebo, but the young patients on Paxil were six times more likely to have suicidal thoughts. In fact, this data also revealed that 11 of the 93 children on the study developed serious side effects, of whom seven had to be hospitalized, of whom seven had to be hospitalized, of, of whom seven, seven had, had to be hospitalized. hospitalized. But according to Keller's own administrator, many of those children were either dropped from the study or coded as non-compliant to avoid having to be counted. While admitting no guilt, the drug company settled out of court for $2.5 million, less money than Paxil was grossing every seven hours. Hundreds of civil suits followed, but when Dr. Keller, as lead author of the Paxil 329 study, was deposed by attorneys, he would not admit to much. I can't remember exactly what I said. I, I don't remember anything specific about any of these meetings. If my name wasn't on the top, I wouldn't remember ever having seen it. If I saw them, I don't remember. The answer is, I don't remember. I don't recall if I was. I don't recall asking him, which isn't to say that I didn't. I want to pick up on the uh, question Mr. Coffin asked you about the five-fold increase of the Paxil kids uh, experiencing suicidality over the placebo kids. Do you recall those questions? I do. And you said that you weren't, you weren't particularly aware of that except for with regard to a manuscript that was sent to you in confidence by GSK? Correct. That, that actually is not correct, though. I mean, you actually, this was an issue that had been presented to you by a number of different reporters that you personally responded to. Is that correct? Yes. Um, I don't remember. How could Dr. Keller have known so little about the drug study of which he was lead author? and which he himself used to promote Paxil for children in prominent medical journals and conferences. The ultimate publication of, of Study 329 was ghostwritten by an agency hired by GlaxoSmithKline, and um, eventually, they, uh, after the manuscript was written, uh, they put Martin Keller's name on it as an author. You know, there again, and maybe you can tell me where I can find it in the paper. No, I'm asking you if you were aware. I, I don't remember the specifics. And then we finally showed him a document from GlaxoSmithKline where GlaxoSmithKline says that the study was entirely flawed, it was a complete failed study, and it certainly didn't show that Paxil was remarkably efficacious for treating children and adolescents in depression. Can you read that into the record, please? Essentially, the study did not really show Paxil was effective in treating adolescent depression, comma, which is not something we want to publicize. We asked him, with that information now, you know, how can you s tell us that it would be okay and safe to give a kid Paxil? And he couldn't answer the question. He, he sat back, he put his he head in his hands, and for, you know, the longest two minutes sat there silent. During the last two years of his Paxil study, Keller personally pocketed a million dollars in drug company money none of which he disclosed in his published research. Even psychologist Sigmund Freud played a major role in the creation of the cocaine industry in the Western world, 
writing many glowing articles promoting its use for spiritual distress and behavioral difficulties. Freud, as a psychoanalyst, uh, he, for a while, was promoting cocaine as being a panacea for all kinds of problems. Freud later wrote, The psychic effect of cocaine moriaticum consists of exhilaration and lasting euphoria, produced no compulsive desire to use the stimulant further. What Freud did not reveal was a significant conflict of interest involving two rival pharmaceutical giants, Merck and Park Davis, both paying him to endorse their respective cocaine extracts. Sigmund Freud's early psychotropic drug marketing campaign helped create a major cocaine epidemic throughout Europe at the turn of the century. Clearly, another happy pill would have to be found. 